Okay, class, good afternoon. Before we get started, uh, a couple logistics. A couple logistics. One, um, arguably, this class should have been, you should have gotten this midterm back faster than any of the other classes, I think, because it was 30 multiple choice questions on a Scantron. Uh, you guys took it at 1 p.m. on a Friday. I had the scores in my hand by 4 p.m. that day. So I have the scores. I've had them for a while. Here's the problem. I got the scores back. I thought, oh, this is great. I'll just make a little adjustment and then publish them to, uh, to Colab. And I just I looked at the very first score. And the very first score, the, uh, the person's uh, computing ID, it was based on just how, how what, what level, the, uh, what uh, order they were in the stack. The computing ID was like MKP asterisk space 5K or something like that. And then the next one I looked had a similar error. And the next one I looked, all the, so then I started wondering why are all my scores are messed up. Uh, I pull, started pulling out um, the Scantron sheets. Literally, I'm not making this up. The first Scantron, I sheet, Scantron sheet I looked at, uh, the person had just right justified all the letters, and the computer didn't, didn't, couldn't figure that out. So you know that you had, you had a certain amount of space for your computing ID. You had more space than you needed for your computing ID. Some people decided left justified. Some people decided right. Um, and then the next. Literally, the next one I just grabbed randomly out of the stack I looked at, and the person had left justified. They had written their computing ID, and they had bubbled in an M for their first letter, and then they had bubbled in the Z for their second letter in the same column as the first one. So anyway, just statistics. I'm not, I'm not, it's not your fault. It's just statistically, out of 240 people, there's like 100 of these. And so I've just had to go through 100 times and go, oh, that's this. And, and then one person, they wrote 0001, but then bubbled 0002. And then um, another person just did, got like a 7 on the exam. And it took me going through their exam to realize, oh, the reason they got a 7 is because they had number 1 and bubbled number 2. And they even wrote number 2, even though they had number Anyway, so um, I apologize for that. I promise. Uh, and I still even have one person I'm trying to track down to get to take the exam. Um, so there's just been some complications. I promise I have them, and they're great, and they'll be published soon. Um, that's all I can tell you. Um, here's my other logistical thing before we get started. Uh, we have class Friday, and we will talk about important things on Friday. And I will try to do something particularly awesome. Maybe it'll involve fire. I don't know. but. Uh, I know we're all anxious to get on spring break, but learning about the world in the physics building, it's hard to top that, I'm pretty sure. So please be here Friday. Um, OK, let's get started. So as we know, uh, we're trying to understand how the universe works. We've gotten some really great tools for looking at the world. Newton's laws give us an amazing description of the world. We know if we want something to go, we need to push on it. Thank you, Newton, for that. That's an amazing insight into the world. Or once something's going, it'll tend to stay that way. Uh, we also know that we can look at the world through a different framework, through the framework of energy and conservation of energy. And that gives us a really useful tool for understanding how a lot of stuff transpires. And, and when it comes to collisions and explosions, we've developed even another tool that's extremely useful, and that's impulse and momentum. Now, where we got to last class was all three of those lenses for looking at the world we started by looking in the simplest way possible. That's just one linear dimension. And so most things we've talked about, we've just had a car driving a straight line or something you throw up and it comes straight back down. And so as I, I think last time I used my keys, so I throw something up, it comes straight back down. I can understand that in terms of Newton's laws or impulse momentum or energy, but it's just a linear situation. Now. A lot of stuff in the world moves linearly, but enough stuff in the world moves non-linearly that we also want to develop a framework for that. The nice thing about how the extension is it's just, as we look at things more complex, like things moving in parabolas, in, a, in arcs, really all we have to do is we just have to look at the horizontal and the vertical independent, and we're back to Newton's laws of linear motion. And so when I throw my keys like that in an arc, really what's going on is vertically, my keys are doing this. Vertically, my keys, I gave my keys some initial vertical velocity. They decelerated to zero, and they accelerated back down. So just like that, my keys are going up and down. When I do this, my keys are doing the exact same thing. In fact, if you were standing head on 
looking right at my keys and maybe with one eye closed so you had no depth perception, you would just see my keys go up and down. You actually couldn't tell that there was any horizontal velocity. You would just see keys go up and down. Horizontally, my keys are behaving as they should without any, uh, with, as any object would without any forces acting on it. Horizontally, once I throw my keys, there's no forces horizontally acting on my keys. So horizontally, my keys just do this, straight line, constant velocity. The combination of straight line, constant velocity, and up down is a parabola. And so when we watch things like projectiles, when we watch soccer balls, lacrosse balls, baseballs, basketballs, field hockey balls, all kinds of sporting balls, do their thing, what we're watching is just the same world we've come to understand so far this semester happening in two dimensions at the same time. And so we saw uh, one of my favorite examples of that's, that's that was shooting the target. And the way I shot the target, if you were here, or if you weren't here, or just that if you were here as a quick review, I, want, I, wanted, I knew this target was going to fall. I knew the target was going to fall, and I wanted to hit the target with my blow dart. And the way I hit the target with my blow dart was actually pretty easy. I just aimed at where the target was when it started falling. Because I knew that my dart and the target would both fall at the same rate. So even though the target had no horizontal velocity, it was just going like that, and my dart had lots of horizontal velocity, the, both of them fell at the same rate. And they, I was able to hit the target simply by aiming. The spot I aimed at was the spot where the target was right before it started falling. That's where I needed to aim. And as, as long as I aimed at that, I knew that I could count on physics to do the rest. I, can, I, I knew they, could, they would both fall at the same rate. And you saw, the, if you're here, the first time, it was dead on. It was super bullseye. But then after that, uh, who knows what other effects were going on, air resistance. We'll, we'll do that. OK. So I have, yeah, two, uh, three questions. Uh, middle, uh, uh, yep. Right. That's a great question. So the question is, how do I account for the fact that I have vastly different dif distances? And even uh, take that to the fullest extent, we talked about uh, the Mythbusters episode where they shot a bullet. They shot a bullet, and actually, the little device I had where I, um, when I pushed the air dart button up here, an electric signal went over there and dropped the target. They had a similar device where they had a bullet just held by a robot downrange. And the, bu the robot dropped a bullet at the same time another bullet was fired however far away. And the two bullets landed at the same spot on the ground. Because one just fell straight down, and the other, went, the other, trans the other traversed, I don't know, a quarter mile, some crazy distance. And so how do I account for the fact that the two, these two distances are different? Um, I think that's the beauty of it, is I don't even have to think about, I can think about them two completely independently. So what's going to happen is, if, if I were in, I, maybe here's another way to think of it. If I were in space or there was no gravity, if there was no gravity, here's how this same exact experiment would go down. I would push fire. My dart would travel in a perfect straight line because there'd be no horizontal forces. I would give it a little initial impulse. That was the dart. Oh, and by the way, that was air pressure. So I have 15 pounds per square inch on this side. I just introduced maybe... I think it was 40 or 50 on this side, and the difference was pushing on the dart, and that accelerated the dart. Pounds per square inch, say, let's call it one square inch. It was one, uh, maybe it was 10, 15 pound, pounds of force acting on that little dart, so it accelerated really fast. But anyway, so imagine I'm in space, I have no gravity. The only, once the dart leaves, and by the way, it was actually, the, the, there was a little sensor on the exit of the, of the nozzle, or of the muzzle barrel, whatever. There was a little, there was a little sensor on the exit that told the thing when it dropped. So it was actually when it left. So it was done being pushed on. So as soon as it left, that's when the dart dropped. Uh, that's when the target dropped. In space, this is how it would go down. I, this would go in a perfect straight line because there's no forces on it. And that target would just stay there, even though there was nothing holding it. I'm in space. It's just going to stay there, and I'll get a bullseye. Now, if you add any force or any accelerations to either of those objects, both those objects will accelerate down at the same rate. So my type, if there's no accelerations, no gravity, I'll get a bullseye easy because this target's not going to move and my, and my, uh, my dart's going to follow a straight line. The, where my 
during the time of flight, during the time of flight, let's call it a quarter of a second, during the time of flight, both are accelerating for the same amount of time at the same rate, so they're both going to speed up at the same rate. Maybe that's, that's hopefully that helps. Okay, so they're, regardless of what's happening, and that's kind of the whole point, regardless of what's happening horizontally, they're both experiencing the same vertical situation. Whether they were really close, really far, it wouldn't matter. In fact, I could make it far enough away, I could even get the, the dart to pass its highest point and be arcing down, it would still work. Or I could just shoot it slow enough. I guess I could have backed up the air pressure. I could have lobbed a dart and hit it right on the floor as it was coming down. It would have been the same. Question? Good question. Uh, does the weight of the target matter? And it doesn't because uh, we're on Earth. All things are accelerated down at 9.8 regardless of weight. So little dart, little big, tar big target, big dart, whatever. Everything would accelerate down at 9.8. Mass wouldn't matter at all. So, you know, that's the whole Galileo drops a big rock, little rock out of the lean tower piece of both accelerate 9.8. Same deal. Question? Thou thousand miles per hour? Great question. Um, are the goal today the next 33 minutes is to get to that question. I'm going to hold off on that one. Let's get to that. That's a great question. And the question was, why? Uh, there is, I mentioned last class, there is a speed you could shoot it, theoretically, there is a speed you could shoot a cannon or a dart or a bullet. It would never hit the ground. And we're going to talk about that. Hopefully we'll get there in the next 32 minutes. Okay. Um, so I, before we move on any much further, I have two other examples. Pretty much same thing. Uh, we'll start with this little uh, cart here. If you've ever, I'm sure everyone's done this, if you've ever been skating down the street and had an obstacle and you want to leap over the obstacle but you want your skateboard to go underneath and you want to land back on your skateboard, common experience. Uh, you've always thought, what direction do I jump? Do I have to kind of leap forward over that obstacle? Or do I jump straight up? I can make an eye clicker out of that, I won't. The answer is you jump straight up. First of all, you don't want to push backwards on your skateboard because then, I mean, I'm hoping everyone's tried this at some point in their life, but the first thing everyone does is they try to jump over the obstacle and they push back on their skateboard. The skateboard goes flying that way. They do clear the obstacle, but then they land on the ground, not on the skateboard. What you want to do is you don't want to apl apply any horizontal impulse to your skateboard. You just leap off the skateboard. You and the skateboard had the same horizontal velocity before you separated. So you and your skateboard continue at the same horizontal velocity and you come right back down, land exactly where you were. This is uh, my physics lab version of that. Zoom in a little bit. This is my physics lab version of that. So there's a little ball inside here and when the ball passes this spot right here, or when the cart passes this little spot right here, it's gonna launch a ball and it's gonna launch it straight up. And you might think it's gonna launch straight up, the cart will pass. You know, the, the ball will land behind the cart. So this little cart has a little ball, and it's going to shoot the ball straight up. And the ball, you might think, is not going to land back in the cart because it no longer has the cart to sort of bring it along or anything. But here's the key lesson of what this little demo that I'm about to shoot off, and that is the cart and the ball are moving along at some horizontal velocity. The ball is going to all of a sudden have some vertical acceleration and then come to a stop and then decelerate and come back down. Both of them have the same forces acting on them horizontally. That is, no forces. So when that, when I, after I, I'm going to give that cart a little initial impulse. I now have a cart with, it's frictionless, it's like no other forces acting on it. So I have a cart and a ball cruising along with like no forces acting on them. All of a sudden that ball is going to get shot up, still no forces horizontally, still no forces horizontally. It's going to come right back down if all goes well, right back down into the center of that cup because I can treat what's going on horizontally and, and vertically completely independent. So even though this ball is now going to have some vertical motion, that doesn't change its horizontal situation. So let's give it a try. Okay. So let's see. We should see, I give it a little horizontal impulse. And it lands straight. I think, can we see that? I don't know if you can see that. I'm going to try it again. Maybe I can give a, go, go a little faster than that. So it pretty much goes straight back in the center. And if you can't see that, 
I cheated and have a slow-mo video uh, ahead of time. So here it is. Uh, here's a super slow-mo. There it goes. Nope. Yeah, there it is. OK. Let's try one more time. So right when it passes that gate, you're going to see it shoot straight up. And uh, it'll follow this nice parabola, and it should land straight back in. OK. Here's one other thing worth noting about what we just saw in the video and down here in real life. Another thing worth noting, if you were in the cart, if you were riding this little cart along, if you were in that cart, what you would see is this. You would see physics doing that. It would be indistinguishable to you that the, the, ball, was, the, the ball would not be make a parabola from your perspective. So imagine you're in that car and you can't see the room going by. And once you're going constant velocity, you just feel like you're sitting there. If you've ever been traveling at 700 miles an hour on a, like a large commercial jet, you don't feel like you're going 700 miles an hour because there's nothing telling you you're going 700 miles an hour, especially if you're not looking out the window. And so I guess here's another example. If you've ever been flying on an airplane at a constant velocity in a horizontal direction and done this, and done this, really what happened from us on the ground, your keys made this crazy long horizontal arc, right? So if I was watching you from the ground, I just watched your keys go up a meter and in that time go horizontally, who knows how far, because you're going 700 miles an hour. So everything is relative. When, when Einstein just came up with the whole idea of relativity, that's what he meant. So here's one of your party conversations for spring break, I guess, is that you, you now know what relativity means. So everyone knows that Einstein invented relativity. That's what he means, is that what Einstein said is that there is no, what was the word he used? There is no preferred observer or reference frame. And so when I watch your keys make this crazy long horizontal arc, and from your perspective in the airplane, your keys just come up and down, there's no way to argue that one of us is right. From my perspective, your keys did this. From your perspective, your keys did that. We're both right. It's all relative. And so from the reference frame of, so if I want to think through uh, this 2D motion thing that I'm trying to explain, one way to think of it is, Everything's 1D motion, just depending on your reference frame. And so from the reference frame of that cart, I just watched that ball go straight up and come back down. So it's not surprising to the person in the cart it came back down. It would be pretty weird if someone threw their keys up and they landed over there. And that would kind of break down the idea of relativity. OK. Let's do one more example. And again, it's pretty much the same idea. I think I have a camera for that, too. Let's try this guy. Yep. OK, uh, pretty much similar idea. Once again, taking advantage of some electromagnets. So I have two electromagnets over here on the side. So when I turn my electromagnets on, these little balls should stick. Okay. So when I turn my electromagnets off, both of those balls will be released at the same time. Both those balls will be released at the same time. They both have the same delta H. They both have the same change in height, so I can be pretty confident they'll be going the same speed when they get to this horizontal part here and here. Because they both will have converted the same amount of potential energy into kinetic energy. They'll be going the same speed horizontally here and here. So when this top guy leaves his little cliff here, he's going horizontally at the same speed as this guy's going horizontally right below him. They should run into each other. So again, if I was to watch, if I was to have two balls, if I, was, if I wasn't using a magnet, I was holding these, and someone said, all right, let go in a way that you think will cause them to collide with one another, I'd probably let go of the bottom guy first, give him time, then the other guy was shooting and catch him or something. I think it's a little counterintuitive, but if I think through the physics, when this guy leaves at the same horizontal velocity as this guy, they should collide because they have the same horizontal velocity. They're tracking with one another, even though this guy is accelerating downward and this guy is not. Hopefully that'll convince you of what I'm trying to say. Then we can move on. I can't even see if this goes well. OK. I think I saw on the camera. It worked, right? OK. Um, yeah, so probably don't even need to do that one again. I think that makes the point. 
So whether it's the monkey or the cart or this one, I want us just to believe that when I'm talking about Newton's laws, they work in one dimension. And I might have three dimensions happening simultaneously, but I can just look into, at Newton's laws in the X and the Y and the Z, and I can understand what's going on. Same goes for energy and impulse and momentum. Okay. So the reason we wanted to start thinking about a second dimension is that, as I said, there's enough things in this universe that just don't move in straight lines that we do need to introduce that second dimension. So if I want to know particularly how projectiles work, projectiles are best understood by thinking about what's going on horizontally, because there's usually not forces horizontally. Thinking about that independent from what's going on vertically, and what's going on vertically is stuff is accelerating straight down due to gravity. That's usually why I want to chop them up. So gravity is this sort of pervasive thing that if I'm on a planet, is always happening. It's always down. And so when I want to understand what's going on in a situation, I can look at what's going on vertically. That's probably got a G in it. And I can look at what's going on horizontally, and that probably doesn't have a G in it. That's my motivation mainly for chopping things up in X and Y. OK. I want to look at one other place where we can look at Newton's laws, where we can look at Newton's laws and impulse moment and work, work in energy. And that is, enough things in this universe don't just go in straight lines and don't just go in X and Ys. There's enough things in this universe that go around that we need to develop a framework for those things. Then we're done with the moving parts. I've been saying we're trying to understand the moving parts of the world. That's it. I'm going to understand moving parts in terms of the linearly moving parts, the parts that are moving in more than one linear dimension at one time, and the parts of the universe that are going around. And there's enough, like I said, enough stuff in the world going around. For example, we're going around the sun. Earth's going around us. Or the moon's going around us, right? And car wheels, tires go, bicycle wheels, bicycle gears and pulleys go right like that. Um, car engines go like that. And actually, uh, probably more than you realize, so much of motion in the modern world is a motor. Even if what you're looking at is not nice and circular, it probably came from something circular. And so when your phone vibrates, that's a little motor spinning around. And it's just got an off-center weight, so it jiggles when it, when it goes around. Or uh, when you, I was about to say, when you spin up a CD or a DVD, but who does that anymore, right? Um, even when, the, when you, the power that is in, in most, probably in this room and in, probably in your house, is coming from a generator or a turbine that's spinning around or something like that. So enough stuff in this world spins around. We want to develop a framework for that. So that's our last framework. And so I'm going to use this wheel as a way to talk about that. I don't know if you can see. I've got little things stuck to the wheel. I've got little, here's a little pink poof ball or something stuck there. So if I were to try to describe the motion of anything on this wheel, like one of these green or pink poof balls, if I were to describe the motion, I could describe them in terms of x and y, so in terms of linear dimension, linear dimension. So I could describe the position of this little ball right here in terms of x and y. Let's call the axis 0, call that the origin. And so this guy is, I guess we'll call this positive. He's now in the positive direction. Now he's negative y. Now he's negative x. Now he's positive y, no x. And then, so I could describe these things using x and y. And their x coordinate is doing this, and the y coordinate is doing this. That's complicated. involves trig. I don't want to have to do that. So even though I could describe these guys linearly, it's way easier to describe them angularly. And so we need to develop a way to describe things angularly. So here's how I'm going to describe something angularly. I'm going to describe, and yeah, you may have seen this like some math class, but I'm going to describe where it is, how far it is from the axis. I'll call that the radius, right? So I'm going to describe where, it, how far it is from the axis. So this little pink guy is, I don't know, a foot from the axis. So I just need to tell you how far it is. And that's not changing. That's a nice thing. So if I'm, if I'm watching these guys go around, their x and y coordinates are like, the x coordinates doing, is constantly changing, the y coordinates constantly changing. I can actually simplify things a lot if I just describe its radius, because its radius is not changing. This guy, this pink one, is at a foot, still at a foot, still at a foot, still at a foot. Radius not changing. So I can describe where it is using two things. It's radius, how far it is from the axis. And a second thing, it's angular displacement. It's angular displacement. So back like in the second day, maybe in the first day, I don't remember, of class, I said that the way we describe something's position or displacement 
is with like, we'll call it X. So if the origin of the classroom is right here, I have just displaced myself positive one meter in the X direction. And here's another meter in the X direction. So that's my displacement. It's how far I am from the origin. In the angular realm, we describe thing we describe thing there we describe something's displacement in terms of not meters but in terms of angle. And so this thing, let's call let's call where it is right now zero. So it's at zero angle right now. Now it's up here at 90 degrees. So its displacement, you know, was like negative a foot and positive a foot. I don't want to worry about linear dimensions. I'll just say it stayed at the same radius and it moved 90 degrees, and then it fell down. Okay, so we're going to use the radius and angle to describe where stuff is. Now, at the risk of getting a tiny bit technical, we're, the angle we're going to use, we're not going to use degrees. So if you ever had like a TI-83 and every time you typed in an answer, you're like, should I be in degrees or radians? We're, at, we're not going to do any computing in this class. You don't need a TI-80 anything. But uh, I, do like to I, lo I do like to describe things in terms of radians. That's how most of the scientific world describes angular things in terms of radians. And if you've ever heard that term, you might know that what a radian is, there's a picture of a radian. A radian is just the angle you sweep through when you sweep through one radius of displacement. So you can see that darkened black circle. So that's one radius. That black part is one radius. So if my, if my bike wheel has a radius of a foot, I know I'm tr I've turned one radian when I've traveled a foot along the arc. So if I travel, if this is one radius and I travel one foot, I've gone one radian. It's like 57 degrees or something, I forget, but you can see it in the picture. Cool. So one radian of displacement is about, you know, yay much, about 50, 60 degrees. And again, we don't get too much into the numbers, but I just want you to know that's how we're going to measure displacement is not how far you went linearly, just how far you displaced angularly. And so I've got my little pink poof ball here. He just displaced one radian by rotating. And he just displaced another radian. And he's just gone a third radian. And now he just went 0.14 radians. And now he's gone 3.14 radians. That gets him to the other side. And then he goes another 3.14 radians, and he's back to where he started. 2 pi around, 6.28. Too many numbers. All right, well, that's, that's enough of that. OK, so um, what I want us to know in this class, what I want us to know is I think the f uh, one of the first things we have to do is just come up with some translations. So in this class, we've talked about where stuff is angularly. We've measured, or linearly, we've measured that in meters. Angularly, we're going to measure stuff in radians. Linearly, the rate at which you're changing your displacement, the rate at which you're changing your displacement, we call that velocity, measured in meters per second. Probably not too much of a mystery. It's, it's too mind-blowing to realize. L angularly, we're going to measure how quickly you're changing your angular displacement, or the rate of change of angular displacement which is called angular velocity. Angular velocity measured in radians per second. So again, here's one of the reasons this makes this really does simplify life. This little pink poof ball here, right now, his x position is doing this, his y position is doing this, but his angular velocity is just constant. So right now, this guy doesn't have a constant velocity. His velocity is going positive, negative, positive, negative. It's up, down, up, down. But this guy's angular velocity is just constant. He's going around, well, let's see. There's roughly six radians in a circle. So this guy's going about six radians a second. One, two. He's going about six radians a second, nice and constant. His displacement, how far he's traveling, is about six radians every second. Let's go speed him up a little bit there. One, two, three. That's about six radians per second right there. So previously, we've, talked, we've only talked about velocity in terms of meters per second. We can talk about angular displacement per time or radians per second. So this guy's just going a nice constant six radians per second. That's his angular velocity. I've used lowercase omega. That's what that is. So we're in, the, we're in the Greek now. That's theta and omega. We're all in frats. That's easy, right? OK. So 
That's omega for radians per second. And not surprisingly, we want to know how fast that's changing. So I've got how fast I'm changing my linear velocity. That's meters per second per second, or meters per second squared. We're going to use lowercase alpha, and that's radians per second squared. OK. Trying to decide where to go next. Okay. Let's do one other linear to angular. I think we have time for this. Yeah, let's do one other linear to angular. Uh, and then we're going to talk about astronauts, because we should. I'm going to put that down there. It's going to fall over. OK. OK. Um, we have to talk about mass. So in the angular, in the linear realm, we've got mass. And in the angular realm, we have mass. That's no surprise. Now, one way to think of mass in the linear realm is something's resistance to being accelerated. So if something is massive, it, it wants to stay put. In fact, again, I've talked about the definition of mass. Another word for mass is inertia. Inertia comes from Latin inert, lazy, doesn't want to do anything. So something in motion linearly wants to stay in motion linearly. Something at rest linearly wants to stay that way. That's something massive. Angularly, we pretty much have the same concept. Something at rest angularly doesn't want to get spun up angularly. Something spinning doesn't want to stop spinning. And so I like to think of mass. Another term I use for mass is shakeability. I want to know how massive something is. I shake it. In the angular realm, instead of shakeability, we have spinability. And so something's spinability is the analog to mass, how difficult it is to spin. Can I, this is one of my favorite, uh, uh, can I get a, a volunteer to just test something out for me? I would love one volunteer to come up here. You don't have. Sure, one of you guys, come on down. Or both, you could both come down, sure. Do we could share this experience. Okay. So we're about to test the shakeability and spinability of two objects. And after class, I, I think everyone should grab these and, and see what we're doing up here. So yeah, maybe just hold, hold it right in the center like I'm doing it. Yeah, tell me which one, tell me what you think about the mass of these two things. Probably equal mass. Pretty, so you hold it like this, you're measuring the mass. That's a good way to measure masses. Give it a good shake, right? Okay. Pretty equal mass. Now. You hold that one. Now, what I'm going to ask you guys both to do, so, you know, if, I, if, you were, if we were to have like a, a curling contest or something, I think we'd, it would be about a tie. They're both about the same weight. Now, grab it and try to spin it like this. Try to, yeah, like that. Go as fast as you can. So this guy's going way faster. Same mass, right? They were about the same mass. This guy's going way faster. Now, let's switch and see if one person's just stronger or what's going on here. Yeah. Way easier, right? Way easier. Way harder? OK. Thank you very much. That's the whole demo. Thanks. <laughs> OK. OK. So wow. Oh, wow. I should have, yeah, that's funny. I should have you do it both at the same time. Everyone should try that both at the same time. So here's what I have. I have two bars up here that have about one kilogram of mass. This is some aluminum or metal, steel, or something like that. So I have about one kilogram in my hand right now. My other hand has about a kilogram in it. If I were to try to shake them, this actually feels identical right now. And you'll have to take my word for it until after class you come up here and try it. This feels identical. I can't tell that these are different right now. I swear. This feels completely identical. Because both of these have about 8 bazillion aluminum atoms. This one has 8 bazillion aluminum atoms. That defines their shakeability. These have the same mass. Spinability has to do with mass. Spinning this is difficult because there are 8 bazillion aluminum atoms. But spinability has to do also with their arrangement. And mass, is that's different than mass. So when I want to accelerate something, I could accelerate this bar right here, this one kilogram. I could accelerate it this way, or this way, or this way. It's the same difficulty. It's just one kilogram. One kilogram this way, one kilogram crunched into a ball, one kilogram spread out in a, in a pole. Still one kilogram, same difficulty to accelerate. Now, how these atoms are arranged matters, changes drastically their spinability. This kilogram, even though they look almost identical, this kilogram 
most of its mass is squished down to where my hand is. And so most of the mass is at the axis of rotation. And distance from the axis of rotation affects your spinability. So even though this looks the same, most of the matter, most of the mass here is at my hand. So very few aluminum atoms are more than a couple centimeters from the axis of rotation, which is my wrist. So I can spin this one really rapidly because it looks like I've got a bunch of stuff up here, but I only have a, this is hollow. This is hollow, and so most of the mass is down here. This very similar looking bar is, is the opposite. Most of the mass is here and here. Same one kilogram, same difficulty to do this, much hard, this is literally as hard as fast as I can do this, as opposed to this one. So you, yeah, that's crazy. And so you guys saw that, that these guys were not baking, that this is about as fast as you can do this. It's like trying to, it's practically breaking my arm doing that because once it gets going, I've accelerated it. I now have mass in motion. It tends to stay that way and it wants to keep going that way. And in fact, it's probably worth probably worth knowing. Uh, I'll throw the formula up eventually. The spinability of something goes up with the square of how far away the mass is. It goes up with the square. So if I take some mass and I put it right down here, it's kind of hard to spin. If I double how far that mass is away, it's four times harder to spin. So I've got this thing called spinability, which is the a angular analog of mass. And it has to do with how much stuff I have. It has to do with kilograms. It has to do with the actual uh, aluminum atoms in here. But it also has to do with how they're arranged. One other example. This is very hard to do like this. Take this exact same one kilogram and do this piece of cake. I can accelerate this really easily. Think, well, it's still one kilogram. But all, as I do this, the axis of rotation is right down the center of the pole. No, no aluminum atoms are more than a centimeter from the axis of rotation. I can accelerate this thing like crazy. And so we've got this idea of spinability. The term in physics, which we may, may come relevant to us, is moment of inertia. That's the, that big mouthful, moment of inertia, is the, an, is the an, angular analog of mass. It means spinability. Moment of inertia means spinability. We're going to use capital I. And there's the units. The units for mass are kilograms. The units for spinability or moment of inertia is kilogram meters squared. So maybe you can see just in the units, something's going on with distance. So it's not just how massive this thing is, it's how massive it is and how the atoms are arranged. So how difficult something is to spin has to do with how the atoms are arranged. Okay, We'll get more into that next class. We still have six minutes left. I think we should do an eye clicker, which will probably just set us up for next class. Okay, so here's the eye clicker for the day. There is a, there's a picture of an astronaut floating on the International Space Station. Hopefully you know this. We humans have built a lab and it's up in space. That's awesome. So most humans live on Earth. We've actually managed, we have our first, we have our first outer space outpost. It's called the International Space Station. Well, it's not the first, but we have a outpost and it's the International Space Station. There's humans up there. There's humans living their days, sleeping, eating, exercising, doing, going to work in space. And there's a picture of an astronaut floating serenely through the, uh, some capsule in the space station. I want to know what is the acceleration due to gravity. Right now, I think we all know we're feeling 9.8, right? I want to know what she's experiencing right now on this space station. 0.0, .0 there's no gravity, right? It's an option. Uh, just microgravity, you might have heard that term before, almost zero, roughly half or roughly 9.8. Okay. I'm so tempted to just not tell you, make you come. I'll answer, I'll, I'll leave the, I'll tell you the answer on Friday. How about that? No, I won't do that. Um, Let's see. 
I think I will have to reveal it. You'll be mad at me if I don't. Okay. Should we tell? Should we reveal it? Okay. <clears throat> Take about ten more seconds. Lock in your answers. Okay. Um, we're going to talk more about this next class, but before we leave for today, I do want to explain a little bit about what's going on with that astronaut. So the astronaut we just saw on the space station, or this astronaut just floating serenely in space. Um, it is a common misconception that that astronaut right now is floating serenely in space. That astronaut, oh, we have to get back to your question. So this will, this will tie everything together. That astronaut right now is not floating serenely in space. That astronaut is going Wah! at 17,000 miles an hour. That astronaut right now is going 17,000 miles an hour. This astronaut is going 17,000 miles an hour. If you, ever want to know why, if you ever want to know why stuff burns up in space, because it's going 17,000 miles an hour and then hits atmosphere. That's fast. Why are they going 17,000 miles an hour? We picked that speed. It's a very precise speed. It's like 17,268 or something. The space, that astronaut right there is zipping through space at unimaginable speed because the gravity where they are, well, if I were to draw, if I were to draw to scale where that astronaut is, here it is roughly to scale. Here's the Earth, here's the space station, and here's that astronaut. That's roughly to scale. That's even a little exaggerated. The space station is in space, meaning just a hair above our Earth's atmosphere. It's not very far from this huge, huge, huge thing called Earth. The acceleration due to gravity on the space station is like 9.6, 9.65, I think. It's about 9.8. So the answer was D. It's about 9.8. I shouldn't have said it. Now everyone's going to leave. All right. Um, let me just finish this next thought, then we'll pack up. Um, and so, if if I, if I were if I were like to somehow just take an astronaut and place him, just place him where that guy is, just place him and let him go, he would fall like a rock. He would accelerate down at roughly 9.8. In fact, he is falling at 9.8. This lady right here is falling at 9.8. She actually can't tell that she's not inside an elevator that's rocketing toward the bottom of a, a, an elevator shaft in a building. So the only difference between that guy and somebody who's really scared is the fact that he's going so fast sideways, he keeps missing the earth on his way down. So if you ever like dr skied off a bump really fast or driven off something really fast, like a bump, and you're kind of in the air, even though you're only hovering above the air, you know, it takes a long time to land. Same situation. This guy's going so fast sideways that he's falling like a rock. He's falling at about this fast. But he just, the Earth is, he's going fast enough that he keeps missing the Earth on his way down. That's what we've done with the space station. We've taken all the components and all the people of the space station, brought them up into space, and we didn't just drop them off. We got them going at 17,000 miles an hour and then let them go. And then they just keep doing this. Around and around and around and around. So next class, we'll talk more about that in detail, and we'll probably have some stuff left that we'll need to talk about on Friday, and then it'll be spring break. Thanks. <laughs>